Welcome to episode 23 of the Self Care 101 podcast with your host, Pooja K. McClymont, helping people achieve their full potential with effective self care through wellbeing coaching. Thank you so much for listening today. This is a very special episode for me. I get to interview one of my clients, India, who shares her journey from struggling with depression to thriving by learning how to manage her mental health. I met India at my first retreat. She came to me after leaving a job and not feeling motivated to do anything. She was low, but she was hiding it. On the retreat itself, she opened up about a traumatic experience that snowballed into affecting her work and her mental well-being. As the topic of the trauma is very sensitive still, we won't be disclosing it, but trust me, it was traumatic and her life could have gone in a very different direction if she hadn't found the strength within her to fight. I personally adore India. She is such a vibrant, infectious and beautiful person to be around. I'm sure you'll see how fun she is on the show. (laughs) We also talk a little about a topic that India and I are very passionate about mental health awareness. Our opinions are pretty strong and I have to stress that every person must do what is right for them and that we are only sharing our opinions from the experiences that we have both had with depression. So let's get to it. Okay, so I am super excited and we're obviously going to get straight to it. India, thank you so much for doing the show for me today. This is very exciting. Thank you so much for having me. We've taken a hot minute, let me tell you, to try and actually get together, decide what we're going to do the show about, and finally meet. And it's been very like serendipitous, hasn't it, that it's we've been, been able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so finally we're together and we're able to do this podcast. And we're going to start with India sharing her journey. And our reference point is the 15th of March, 2019, <laughs> when we actually met at Champneys when we did the retreat together. And then I think what we're going to talk about is a topic that's quite close to both of our hearts, which is mental health, and more specifically mental health awareness, because it's kind of annoying us. (laughs) We think it's a great thing, but we've got quite a few annoyances with it. And I think you might be able to, as a listener, share some of our annoyances with it. So we'll talk about that later on in the show. So, India, I'm going to hand over to you and, yeah, just tell us a little bit about your journey from when we met and to where you are now, because you're fabulous right now. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I uh, used to live in London. I lived here for 10 years. Um, I was an event planner. Really enjoyed it, absolutely loved it. Um, And it was great, great fun, but it was very stressful. And um, when I came to Champneys, I was not in a great place, as you know. I had been through quite a lot of traumatic experiences, like over the last two years pre, like meeting you, and it it kind of just threw me really. So, what kind of stuff was happening? Like, you don't have to talk about the actual trauma, but how were you feeling? What was happening with you in your life before you actually? Yeah, I was just extremely stressed down depressed is probably the right really? word for it yeah. and just I completely lost myself my where I wanted to be who I was just completely disappeared yeah. I, I didn't even know who I was really and I was just I, I was living on my own and I just would sit there many nights just what am I doing with my life why am I still here like it was just I just was yeah, just completely lost. And you're quite a social person. You've got like a big social yeah. network, haven't you? Yeah, and I love meeting new people. Yeah. I love chatting. Like, when my our phone <laughs> chat the other day was like literally like an hour and a half. It was great, but <laughs> I mean, we'd still be there today. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Me too, me too, totally. <laughs> um, but yeah, just really didn't want to talk to anybody. Didn't really want to go out. Um, and I kind of had that quite a few years ago as well, where... I was really depressed and down and I kind of got myself out of that mm-hmm. through that support of my friends and family at the time but then it just obviously like triggers happened and then I just spiraled down quite a deep dark hole of what is depression but if you don't know that you're in it yeah and you don't you feel it but you're like mm, no that's not it or you don't I don't know it's like a weird kind of yeah. trapped feeling um and yeah I really didn't want to be at work I kind of moved jobs because I thought that would make me happy, that didn't make me happy, and then I just thought, oh, 
you know, maybe dating would make me happy. That didn't make me very happy. <laughs> no. Like not, nothing was working, yeah. really. And um, it wasn't until my dad booked it for my birthday present um, to come to you. And we had so many intense discussions, mm -hmm. which were just so impactful on me, being able to sort of declutter my, my brain. Let's just go back a little step. So how did, now I call Mr. Paul Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> how did, because I, I initially got the phone call from India's dad and I thought it was lovely. I thought it was, he, it was just sort of like a very light, you know, oh, this would be nice for my daughter sort of present. <laughs> I didn't know how deep it really was and yeah. especially the decision-making process for him to have decided to do that and give it to you because it it's hard when you're when you're in that state yeah. of mind um, with the depressive thoughts to actually take action to something, and then even when your loved ones are giving you help, you can still be really resistant to it because it's just like, oh, you don't understand, yeah. Because that's where you're where you are, right? In yeah, your definitely. mind, it's you, like you're not in my brain. Yeah, you don't, you don't know, know anything. What's a retreat gonna do? Yeah. And blah 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 blah. And what would you know? You know, yeah. like you're 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 my parent. What would you know? You know, yeah. and it, all of those sorts of thoughts. And I thought it was really. I, I I loved that he did it because it was obviously through care and you know he carefully looked at the, the the offering and and my website and stuff and had a chat with me and I felt like it was the right thing but I did need to speak to you as well because with this and even like with coaching as a whole it's a you can't you can lead a horse to water but you can't make anybody drink yeah. so even with the work that I do look, I do it, these are the programs, yeah. you know, everything's available, yes, you will see change and it will have an effect, but it's up to you if you want to do it. It doesn't yeah. work unless you want to do it. So what was it that helped you accept the help from your dad at that point? I would just trust everything that he says and does, if really? I'm honest. Yeah. Wow. Because when I like was in a bad place in sort of 2014, I came back home mm. and lived at home for a bit, um, and I couldn't go, couldn't leave my house. And, and home is out of London, recent. right? Yeah, Bristol. Bristol. Yeah, Bristol's now my home. <laughs> uh, I keep forgetting that, actually. <laughs> yeah, you're not a Londoner anymore. Yeah, not a Londoner. Um, and he was he was the one who's always been like, come on, you've got to go out. We're going to go for a walk. We're going to go for a run. Like, in, you know, he hadn't run for years, but he was the one that was like, right, we're going to go running. We're going to do this together. And it was amazing to have him there. So mm. he knows my triggers and he, he kind of knows when I'm not in a good place. Right. And he just thought, you know, it's like in a spa and I'd be able to unwind and relax and that will help as well. Mm. And I just listened to him because... I don't know, I, I really value his opinion and yeah. and my mum's obviously, but like, you know, it was his idea and they discussed it and come together and that was the conclusion. But I'm so glad that he did it. Yeah. I, if he hadn't, if he hadn't done it, I wouldn't have, I remember calling him on the way back from the retreat just saying, by the way, I'm coming home. That was like, literally <laughs> the first thing I said. Oh. And they've wanted me to come home for ages. Really? Yeah, because they just... They, I think they could see that I was not in a good place and mm. they could see that I didn't really want to be there but you have to make that decision for yourself yeah. and they've always said that to me because I'm very strong-minded. <laughs> Bad quality, good quality, it's kind of indifferent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, who's asking. Yeah. <laughs> who's in the crossfire. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, you've got to be that person to say, I'm going to do that mm. and uh, I was... You know, I, I, he was just like, well done, like, thank you. We've been wanting you to do that and say that that's what you wanted to do for so long. Yeah. And this is like the turning point, really. And I, yeah, I haven't looked back yeah. at all. So how was it when you, obviously, daddy, <laughs> bought the package, you put it in your diary, we had a little chat. Yeah. And... Then you get to retreat day and you came, and this is not a plug for the retreat, but just to sort of give some context to how you process to obviously get to those decisions mm. in two nights, really, yeah, right? We were in there for two nights. Yeah. So what was sort of like the feelings before you got to Eastman Manor, for instance? Yeah, well, I think when you know in your gut, you kind of know that like the decisions that I made, I knew, mm -hmm. but in my gut, deep down somewhere, hidden around. Yeah. But you say to yourself, uh, you know, I don't want to move out of London. All my friends are in London and, mm -hmm. you know, it's the best place for me. Why wouldn't it be? I've been here for so long. My job's here and, you know, um, all, 
all sorts of reasons you convince yourself that that's the best thing for you. And all the while knowing that you're not well and you, you're you just in this perpetual cycle. You just keep going round and round in circles, right? Yeah, like it's, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. Mm. But that's just what you do when you're not in a good place as well. Like yeah. you just beat yourself up. And I think going through the stages of breaking down I remember doing the wheel oh yeah and like breaking down what you think you're doing and then actually realistically that's not what you're doing you really don't do that Mm. and being honest with yourself Mm. and you made me be honest with myself which actually is really difficult to do because I think everyone wants to be in a certain way or they think that in in a certain way they're really not Mm. and it's hard to suddenly go okay actually I'm like this or I'm like that and I I had to really be honest and true to myself and you made me do that and <laughs> in the nicest way possible, in the really <laughs> nice way <laughs> lots yeah. of hugs <laughs> lots of hugs and cuddles yeah and it was a really challenging weekend like yeah. there was a well as you know there was a lot of tears yeah and there was a lot of upset because I was bringing everything back to the surface mm. again mm. and saying okay and actually back to this whole victim thing it was it was kind of saying to myself yeah, you've been a victim, but don't treat yourself like a victim because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you've come out the other side of it. You're still alive. Yeah. You you still got your health. What and... was it that made you get there? So what was it that made you realise, obviously that strength within yourself, yeah. to say that I'm not actually a victim because I have come out the other side. I might not be in a great place, but I've still come out the other side. What was What, what? happened? I think it's talking to everybody in the group. Oh, as oh well. actually on the retreat. Okay. On the retreat, oh, right. yeah. Because I think it's always having like you have to find that inner strength somewhere. And I've always been that sort of person that will always get themselves up, brush themselves off, and get yeah. on with it. Yeah. But I kind of need like that bit push sometimes mm. to do that, it's particularly when you're in a depressive kind of state. You need something somewhere mm. to kind of give you that yeah but like we said only you can change yourself so you've got to be in that place mm. and you know listening to everybody's stories that day everyone's everyone's got problems yeah. everyone's struggling somewhere they don't want to admit it not everyone does like a particularly not a, being a sexist thing but men do s- struggle with that yeah. like you know just saying how they're feeling and I think just hearing that everyone has a problem and you're not on your own Mm. and yeah all our problems were completely different and all on varying scales Mm. and but they're really important to that person and they were making that person incredibly upset Mm. so we bonded on that reason yeah like not the same reasons not the same reasons that we were there but we bonded because of that Mm. you helped to bring us in that situation in that environment and we were all sort of looking at each other's wills like oh yeah you think that about yourself too? Yeah, me too. <laughs> We're really similar in there's so many ways. Yeah. I think that was probably the most impactful moment for me um, because it's really important, like, the whole... The, the reason why I do these group retreats is because when you can start aligning yourself to people essentially strangers Mm. who are also going through stuff who are also being vulnerable in a way that they wouldn't normally be or wouldn't normally be with people close to them you know because sometimes there's that judgment kicks in and you don't feel like you can be completely open with your friends and your family and sometimes you don't want to share every detail with your family and friends and It's difficult, but when you're in that sort of forced environment, if you're like with strangers and obviously as a coordinator of the group, everyone's doing the same task at the same time. And it's up to you when you're attending Mm -hmm. how much you want to share. And I felt that all of you on that group, there were five of us, all of you on the five of you on the group were actually, you came with kind of an idea of what you wanted to work on and by the first afternoon, there was this safety and trust within everyone, yeah. non-judgmental environment that everybody could comfort. feel. The comfort, yeah. yeah. And obviously the support, I was there. So if anyone fell, you know, there, yeah. there, there was somebody who could, you know, catch you. Yeah. And what I found the most amazing was how you all actually caught each other. Yeah. So you were all there for each other. And, you know, if when one person was crying about something, someone else was comforting. Yeah. And I remember the moment on the retreat, actually, that really, like, it got all of us. Yeah. And Julia was feeling quite low. Yeah. Wasn't she? And then we did a sort of, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of exercise almost. But... And Victoria said, I want to be like you, Julia, when oh, I grow up. 
that had us all. We all burst <laughs> into tears, <laughs> including me. Yeah, we we all, all started cry. crying because Julia was feeling really, really low and re- really, you know, she'd been beating herself up for quite a while. And, yeah. you know, it broke our hearts, obviously, to see her like that because all we got from Judy was just this amazing, beautiful yeah. spirit. Really positive and kind and loving. So kind, yeah. right? And then Victoria turned around and Victoria was, what, 24 at the time. She said... I want to be like you when yeah. I'm older. I just love everything about you. And oh, like like we said, we all yeah. started crying. <laughs> you she know. just couldn't believe it. She's yeah. like, what do you mean you want to be like me? Why, why would you want to be like me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> crying and then, yeah, but that's the thing. You find the strength that like Victoria saw what we all like see yeah. in Julie. Uh. Julie, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then... It's like <laughs> we <laughs> we had lots of laughs because some of us are, were a little older than um, India, <laughs> just a little bit. And India and Victoria really connected. I mean, they connected in a way that we sort of fantasize about getting boyfriends and girlfriends <laughs> who we connect to in this really romantic way. They were full on Richard Gere and Julia Roberts yeah, we on this weekend. Were. They yeah. actually were inseparable and we loved it. We had a girl man. You did. What, what, was, <laughs> what was the spark between you and what happened? Oh, we just sort of connected with the same sort of sense of humour and like when we were in yoga we just couldn't stop laughing and giggling but we really shouldn't laugh in yoga. <laughs> it's meant to be like zen and we just, yeah, fits of giggles constantly. Yeah. I don't know, I saw so much in Victoria that I... Because, I mean, I'm now in the 30 Club. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> welcome, welcome. But I saw so much of myself in Victoria when I was her age. Mm. Not that we're mi- miles That's apart, cool. but I saw parts in me, in in her, and I don't know, I just connected with her on so many levels, really. Um, and, you know, she struggled so much with certain things, and, you know, she, with her anxiety and... I've struggled with my anxiety and, you know, depressive thoughts and all sorts of things. So it was just, I don't know, we had like a similar yeah. bond. Yeah, I, I felt that because you were also supporting each other. So when Victoria was feeling a bit low, you were picking her up. And when you were feeling low, she was picking you up. And yeah. it was like you, we talk about, in relationships, we talk about love language. But it was very much, you guys had the friendship language, you were speaking to each yeah. other's souls, essentially, yeah. you know, without getting too woo-woo, but <laughs> yeah, you, you were literally speaking to each other's souls. I mean, we all loved it, the older ones. We were like, <laughs> oh my God, they're so cute. And they're just like, oh, they're, they're, they're the kids of the group, but not in an immature way, just like, oh, they've got their whole lives ahead of them. And, you know, we were, you know, we're sort of 10 years ish senior to them and you know we we remember being 24 29 you know so we, yeah. we we know what was happening in our lives at that point and for them to be taking a hold of their lives and choosing to change the path that they're on was such an inspiration for all of us because not to say we're running out of time as because we're older but you know time is a factor for us as you get older so to see younger people actually taking control was it inspired us to essentially get our shit together as well you know like like I talk about all the time I'm not perfect and you know none of us are and that's a silly thing to try and work towards yeah so life is about learning and growing and for us I think we were so inspired by you and Victoria's oh, like nice. strength yeah. to actually take control of the, your situations and actively want to try and fix it. And to see you guys bond and be able to support each other as well, because beyond the retreat, life is not a t- retreat. So mm-hmm. to have created that little tribe between us and that you and Victoria could call upon each other post retreat, yeah. that must have been so helpful. Because I know from Victoria that it was helpful. Yeah, she loved it. it has been really helpful. And going on that sort of like secret kind of language between mm. us, it was like we didn't have to say anything. We just knew that maybe you needed a hug or, you know. And yeah, yeah post retreat, it was nice to know that if I had a down moment or she did we could message each other yeah and kind of just say oh are you okay or like this has happened or but we kind of knew how each other felt it was nice to have that afterwards mm. and obviously like we have a group chat so we can all sort of say things on there as well yeah so it's, it's just constant support 
That's really good. So then after the retreat, you decided, well, you called Daddy and told him, I'm coming to Bristol, I'm moving yeah, back home. I'm coming back home. Tell me about the events from then. <laughs> so I, yeah, so I moved, I decided I was going to move back home. My dad was like, right, let's sort it out then. What should we do first? Kind of thing. It was like <laughs> chaos because <laughs> I was renting my flat. We were still in contract with mm. them. So my dad got in touch with my landlord and basically arranged to, for me to come out as, as long as I could find somebody else that was willing to go in. But it was a beautiful flat, so I was like, no, there's been no problems, like, fine, trying to find somebody to get in. Mm. Um, then there was a lot of things, so I have a house bunny, as you know, so, like, he had to go back home and... <laughs> Please tell the listeners about the house bunny. <laughs> yeah, shout out to all the bunny lovers out there. <laughs> <laughs> that aren't just as crazy as me. Or well, maybe are as crazy as me. What's his name, Howard? Howard. Howard yeah. the rabbit. Howard the old man, yeah, yeah. that thinks he's a dog, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on many occasions. Yes, yeah, so he's a dwarf flop and I adopted him. And he's like four months. So he's four this year. His fourth birthday. Whoa. Yeah. And I am a bit of a nutter because he does have a stocking at Christmas. I bought him a little Santa's outfit that mm-hmm. he wore. And uh, he has a birthday party. Yeah, so that's exciting for him. <laughs> I don't know how to respond. <laughs> your look on your face was like, really? Are you sitting in my room? Like, what's happening? Please leave. <laughs> I actually don't know how to respond. But I'm glad that Howard brings you joy, yeah. obviously. and actually that's another thing. Like, he was... I'm not a rabbit person. <laughs> I'm not a bunny person. Dogs and cats, but not bunnies. I like, I like dogs. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a cat person. Yeah. But yeah, but bunnies all the way. But he was, he's also been great because uh-huh. I think finding, uh, when I was living on my own, having him there, mm-hmm. like, I just, he'd just come by and just sit with me, but I'd just cry or, like, talk to him. He had no idea what's going on. Yeah. But he, he was the thing there. Well, animals sort of... are quite intuitive, and even though I'm not a bunny person, so I haven't done the research, but I know, like, with having a dog, they do read your energy they they like yeah. kids actually they um react based on your uh, your energy so that he felt, felt you yeah. and knew that there was a shift and you know that he can't speak to you but he can be there <laughs> yeah. and the um i think what's it the oxytocin that's sort of released when you stroke the serotonin maybe i think is released when you stroke yeah. animals it's a comfort it's very yeah therapeutic very therapeutic mm. okay so daddy's got you know, list going, sorted out the landlord. Yeah. And then, how and long until So then Crystal? I just started packing up straight away. Wow. Yeah, I went back home and was just packing, packing, finding any bag and box and anything that was in my flat and yeah. just starting to pack it all up. Um, I went home pretty much every weekend because I, I was not in a job, so I would go home whenever, wherever I possibly could. And you weren't working because of this, mm. yeah, the uh, incident that happened and my job went the best with it and I think that that was yeah. very hard actually for me um because uh, we spoke about this mm. not long ago uh, well, the other day and um for me I'd kind of dealt with the trauma in the sense that I managed to get as much closer closure as I possibly could mm. from it but I found it hard to get the closure from sort of being rejected from a job it like kind of affects you a bit more I yeah. think just because you think oh I, I went through something so awful and yet you can't see that or empathize with that and you just kind of got ridiculed for it yeah and then there's no closure then I started thinking well that's me like it must have been me it's yeah. my fault like well, I wasn't Let's, good at my job you know we're going to explore this when we start talking about mental health because I think that's what, what happened to you at work yeah was obviously ridiculous but I think it's very relevant I think a lot of people do experience you know being treated unfairly at work when they shouldn't be like I I think the topic I guess will be the sort of direction of you know when when bosses are just so um detached from their actual employees but without the employee there is no business there's no company yeah so it's in their best interest well this is it exactly anyway we'll get to that (laughs) in part two (laughs) tanging yeah so a couple of weeks and you're in bristol yeah basically all my stuff as much as i could possibly fit in my car 
um, back I go. And then one of my friends said, oh, hey, by the way, my family's got a house out in Marrakesh. Do you want to go? I was like, well, I've got nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. Why, why the hell not? Mm-hmm. So I went to Marrakesh with my friend, had an amazing time with her, um, ate some great food, and then um, came back home and continued the packing. But when I was actually out in Marrakesh, I decided to get into the dating scene again Mm -hmm. and was like, well, if I'm moving back home, I may as well try and find somebody to settle back down with at home. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I never grew up in Bristol, so I don't have any friends in Bristol. So it was like a completely new start for me everywhere, Mm -hmm. in all all ways. I kind of felt like a new person and I was like sorting bits out little by little. So when I um, went back, and at the end of the holiday, I matched with my now boyfriend, and um, we arranged, actually he drunkenly messaged me <laughs> to meet up, and we had our first date on the Monday when I got back, mm. and we had our second date on the Tuesday, wow. and we had our third date on the Saturday, <laughs> and it's been like that, and we've been together a year in April. Nice. Yeah, that's really nice. Now, I want to, that's interesting. Let's just park that for a second yeah. because this connects really nicely to something else. But when we were on the retreat mm-hmm. um, and we were doing the wellbeing wheel and sort of looking at purpose and what your purpose was and yeah. if you could feel it or anything like that, something that came up was creativity, yeah. like connecting back to your creative self because you've always been creative, right? You've yeah. always been quite crafty in that sense. Yeah. And you hadn't been doing it for a while, but you mm. said it brings you joy. Like yeah. it really does fill you up because we were doing colouring in, weren't yeah. we? And everyone I was sort of, there, like, yeah. Ooh. I think Julia and Victoria won on like the colour coordination. Yeah, yeah. they were really I good can't, Yeah, I still can't do it. I was like, uh, every colour in the rainbow <laughs> all over my page. <laughs> and theirs were really beautifully coordinated yeah. with Dubs, weren't they? It's stunning. And we discovered as we were working on on you that your purpose was connected to creativity very much so. Yeah. So you've obviously settled now into you, you know, at this point we're a couple of months in, you've settled into Bristol. Yeah. How did you decide to create Indie Jade with creation? Yeah, so that's quite exciting. So I kind of always been, as you said, creative and everyone's always pushed me to oh, you should sell your stuff, it's so good. Oh. I thought, nah, it's not that great. Like, just give out his presents yeah. and, you know, it's just a nice feeling to make something for somebody else and then they're like, oh, this is so lovely. And then you're like, oh, is it though? Are you sure? Like, yeah. you, I don't know, it's just like self-doubt and yeah, you just yeah. need to find that self-belief, don't you, that what you're actually making is... Well, good. you were doing it because you just liked it. You yeah. weren't doing it because I want, a, I want or... a business. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I want to make money from this. You, you, the initial purpose for all of that creativity was just because you enjoyed it it made you feel good it was good for your health yeah it was good for my mind my well-being my mindset and I remember going back home and just thinking what have I got to lose um my dad um basically said to me don't rush into anything Mm -hmm. you come back home Mm -hmm. and you take the year and you just have a year off you don't worry about anything. You're coming back home. You don't have rent. You don't have to worry about money. Yeah. Just take the time for you. Yeah. He said you need it, and I just thought, okay, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take his advice, and I'm gonna do that yeah. again. You know, believe exactly what he says. I always sort of really value his advice and his yeah. guidance. You trust it. Yeah, really, really trust it. And I, um, I was like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna just sit here make a logo and just do it. Throw myself a, into the deep end, read loads of things on sort of Etsy and um, how to start up an Etsy page and how to yeah. sort out a business Instagram. And that was the first thing I did, set up a business Instagram. And then um, I was like, right, I need some things to sell. <laughs> Better start <laughs> making something. Yeah. And I remember sitting in the living room with my dad and, we, and um, he came in and he's like, what are you doing? Like, oh, I'm making a logo. He was like, oh, that's exciting. Let's have a look. And I must have had like 50 different like ideas. Yeah. So we were sat there like sort of going through them. And then my mum comes in, oh, what are you doing? Well, I'm looking at logo. Oh, let me have a look. We all sat there trying to choose. Then I was sending them to Isaac, my boyfriend, and we, he was at work. And then I was sending him all these images. And he was like, hmm, I think I like one. I think I like three. And then you have like so many ideas. Yeah. There. Um, but yeah, it was just really exciting. And it was just supported in every way basically yeah. um yeah so indie j creations was formed and then i 
just started looking at fairs. Yeah. I love that you, like, because we obviously talked about being creative and yeah. you know that that's innately you. Yeah. It's like doing all that creativity and the the things that you make for the business every single day it's like you're doing your mental well-being through creation which yeah. it's oh, that sounds really lovely yeah you're actually right that is exactly what i do like it's quite meditative isn't it yeah. the sort of things that you're making and and at um christmas it's really busy because yeah. i'm doing so many fairs yeah and you think, oh, um, don't get stressed about it. Like my dad was like, oh, you're very, very busy. Like, you're yeah. making things for Christmas and you're making things for your fairs and presents and all sorts of things. Like you need to slow down. And I was like, but no, I'm having a really good time. Like having a good time, yeah. yeah. And I'm obviously I'm studying at the moment, so I was studying. And then in the evenings, I was like doing macrame and making candles and all sorts of things going on. And he uh, was like, come on, like, th- you need to take some time. This is what we're doing this year. Like, slow down. Like, mm-hmm. And I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm having a great time. Like, that's my way of, this is my way of relaxing. I'm sat in front of the telly and I'm doing my macrame. Like, yeah. it's not work. It's nice. It's a nice, pleasant pastime for me. That's beautiful. I love yeah. that. I love that. It's such an incredible journey that you've been on. Like, I can't even fathom how far you've come since obviously I met you and you are literally when people talk about leaps and bounds that's literally what you have been and obviously stalking your social media helps so I don't know what's <laughs> I know you're what's, stalking me I am saying you're stalking you're stalking each other but yeah like seeing seeing your progression on social media actually the other girls as well it's not just yourself um Julia loves to swim in the sea in the cold in Kent by the way crazy yeah. woman but you know it's actually giving me shivers yeah <laughs> she does that and then Anna's obviously traveling and Sheikah's doing some amazing stuff with her yeah. like spirituality side of things and she's really uplifting and stuff and Victoria well Victoria is a mental health nurse and she just yeah. helps people you yeah. know like every she's single eating day. loads of different food yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's incredible everyone's doing incredible stuff and everybody's at a different stage of their lives and I love that India's able to share this I really do appreciate you sharing it with everybody because it's not easy and you know we have confidentiality and safety and stuff but I think we're a year in now and even when we were talking about doing the show it was like what what could we do it on I thought let's start with journey and then the other topic that we're both very very passionate about (laughs) I'm ready for this one (laughs) (laughs) is basically mental health awareness now most of you listening to this show are probably aware of mental health becoming quite fashionable of late and I'm using that word on purpose but over the last few years they've been the media's been raising awareness of mental health and then now we've got this huge arm in the well-being industry which is employee well-being employee engagement valuing your employees giving them what they need mental health first stages now in work and we're pro everything that helps people understand mental health do not get me wrong on this we are pro it however (laughs) (laughs) the big however (laughs) the big however and the word is in there how how do people communicate how do you talk to when you are feeling as down as you've never been before how do you actually communicate to the same people that are in your life that may not be on the same plain as you essentially you know so you might be really progressing with learning about mental health and that you've realized that you've got challenges that you struggle with but the people around you may not be there yet and even if they are are they equipped to talk to can you talk to them how do you talk to them because it's the how isn't it like how do you even start where do you start? Yeah. <laughs> What's your What are your thoughts on this? Because I know I can get quite passionate and opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let someone else take we're, the we're mic. We're kind of both like that though. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, you're right. It's how do you do it? How you come across in social media? It's okay saying, let, let's um, let's talk about it. Mm. Let's um, open the platform up to say, uh, we all need to be talking about it. We all need to be open to it and aware of it. But how are you perceiving that to somebody mm. else? Are you sure? Is that even helping that person? Like, you know, there's a lot going around um, on social media currently, mm. as we're all aware. And there's a, a massive, amazing movement raising a lot of money. And it's fantastic. And it has made a positive outcome from it, you know. Mm. Um, but there are other things that we've discussed yeah. recently that are on social media that are 
being used to support mental health, but there, there's not, there's nothing positive coming out of it. Yeah, it's there's, there's, cause see, there's so many like prongs to it. So, if you're feeling down, and if you do suffer from depression or anxiety or whatever it is, and you fill your social media feed with more of the same, what you're doing is you're feeding the disease. Mm. So you're literally just confirming the thoughts, and these are negative thoughts, and negative thoughts thrive in our minds. You're just actually you know validating those negative thoughts by consuming content that says yeah i did this today and you know the best thing i did today was wake up well there's a little bit more that you can do actually yeah. and it's obviously i talk about this a lot on my podcast and the, the work i do one-on-one -on -one, but it's a choice everything is a choice yeah. and i know that i'm touching a sensitive area here with regards to depression but i do feel somewhat qualified just having had my own experience of depression attempting suicide on my life twice so i know at that point at which you're about to do it what is going through your mind and how you can try and come back from it. I mean, it's not like a light bulb moment or anything like that, but there is that piece of you, yeah. that's that tiny piece, if you deep. can find it deep, deep, mm. that you were talking about earlier, if you can find that and someone can connect to it or you can connect to it and say, F this, I'm not doing this. Yeah, coming out the other side. That is the point at which you can. Yeah. And then accepting that it's a journey. Because I think there is that, um, you know when you when you consume information like we do like there's just so much obviously available to us there's this feeling of oh miraculously the drugs are going to make me feel better you know within six weeks it's like mm, they're doing their own thing really and then therapy as well oh if I do therapy then I'll be fine yes but it's a process hun and you've yeah. got to accept that bit because if you can't when you're coming out of depression if you can't accept that it's going to be a journey and it could be a six month journey but it also could be a six year journey yeah. you're more likely to succeed than if not mm -hmm. you know 100 percent. i was told um you know you've got anxiety do you want something for it no no, no, no. like straight, oh, straight away. away was yeah. do you want some medication yeah i don't i don't want that thank you very much so i got leaflets mm -hmm. to read to kind of like understand it all but it's a minefield when you don't understand you don't know what it is you're mm. confused you're wondering what it what is going on with you like what's happening to me yeah. this isn't me um and it, that shouldn't be the uh, first initial thing that you get given uh, off or offered rather yeah. you should get some information and then you should have the option to discuss it and like you were saying i, I did cbt mm -hmm. and it was amazing mm -hmm. i loved doing cbt however a lot of people will do their cbt and then they'll walk away and hope that it stays there and it's lasting. Yeah, it's just fixed. <laughs> yeah, woo, I'm not a new woman. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not how it works. Yeah. You know, I had to come out of that and do my exercises mm. that she gives, that she gave me mm. and really take that. It's like doing the retreat. I couldn't have just come out of it and thought, you know, I couldn't... You needed you, a plan. Yeah. You needed I, to sort of map out, okay, this, the, the first steps, the first few steps at least. Yeah. And then... As you go through those few steps that you're sort of protecting your mental health when you're coming out of it, and the high, obviously, that you get from being on a retreat like that, yeah. then it sort of starts to help you then feel better so that you can then continue the next sort Definitely. of, you know, chapter, yeah. next stage of your life, but yeah. that you're constantly in that learning stage and you're picking up different tools and you're very lucky because you've been able to channel your creativity in your work now. So yeah. you've every single day got your core tool essentially to help your mental well-being. Yeah. But people don't seem to communicate that bit and I think that's where our bugbear is, that yeah. it's a journey. Drugs are not the answer, but they will help you if you are in more of a crisis situation. So if you cannot within yourself, if you literally just talk in circles and circles mm. and circles when you're in that spiral, the medication will help you stop doing that and help you start reframing. But then again, find a good doctor who's going to actively want to taper you off the medication whilst you go for therapy or coaching yeah. or whatever therapies you decide to choose. That's what you need. And... It was funny because it's the, the the our conversation was sparked because I'd read a report recently that actually said that since we've been increasing 
mental health awareness through the media, social media and everything else and being all, you know, let's talk, let's talk, let's be open and employee engagement, etc. The actual amount of prescriptions for depression and anxiety pills has skyrocketed. So... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's madness. And I think there's also a line that... You, you know, like you're saying, it's becoming a little fashionable. Mm. And it, you have to be extremely careful when using, I'm feeling a bit anxious or I'm, Goodbye. you know, there's like a limit. So you might feel anxious. We all feel anxious yeah. about certain things. Mm. That doesn't mean that you've got a mental health condition yeah. necessarily. Chronic anxiety. Like yeah. I see so many, I mean, I know that there's so much feeding into young kids at the moment and there is a lot of anxiety going around. I yeah. hear that. But rather than going for, I talk about this in one of my other shows, but rather than going for the label, because when we talk about mindset, if you start labeling yourself, if you start accepting certain labels, you actually are telling your mind that that is you. And Mm. once you start doing that, that's when it gets really, really hard to undo. Whereas if you can reframe that, I get anxiety sometimes. It's a lot easier for your brain to go, well, it's only sometimes. And your brain then, it's a powerful organ, you know, it will then start helping you. So when you do do things to manage your anxiety that are not pill related, when you do those other things, your brain will go, oh, this helps my anxiety. So then it stays in that frame of sometimes I get anxiety. But I completely agree with what you're saying there. Yeah, and it's it's kind of... like we were saying, how are you going to do that? Like, yeah. what are we going to do to improve that? And I think it's going to be a very, very long road, if yeah. I'm honest. Well, there's so much connected. So, you know, we can all be talking about it and supporting our friends and family and being open. And I have actually, to be honest with you, I have seen a difference since sort of cementing myself as a wellbeing coach and getting, you know, press coverage and, and my friends see, you know, see me on social media and stuff. The, the, since I've been doing this, I guess, and be more established, every time I see someone that I haven't seen for a while, yeah. they're very open to say, oh, I've suffered from depression all my life, or I really suffer from a lot of, you know, deep anxiety. Now, as their friend, I'm not going to coach them unless they ask me to, but it's like, just there when they say, oh, I've suffered from it all my life, I'm like... Do you want to change it? <laughs> you know, I really want to go. Do you want to change it, or do you want to keep suffering? Like, because that's where the choice mm-hmm. is. You and know, that goes back to our whole thing of victimization. I right. think mm-hmm. because you have to want to change, and it takes root, like some somewhere within you. It takes that to say to yourself, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not gonna be a victim anymore. Mm. I'm gonna change that, and I'm gonna do something about it to not." And but you have to get to that point yourself to want to keep doing it like you know after the retreat after Mm. your coaching keep doing those things that are gonna make you stay in a positive way Mm. and not victimize yourself like you know reading things on social media and thinking that's me that's me you know right exactly we put things up to get a reaction from somebody yeah so maybe i think I think we've shared our opinions <laughs> quite fiercely just now. Maybe if there is anything that from, because obviously through my podcast, I do share a lot of how um, in the work that I do, but maybe from your own experience, is there a how that you can share with people who I guess, you know, are aware of that we can talk now, it's much more easier, there's not that much stigma. Oh, that's the other thing. So there's not, (laughs) we can talk about it now, there's not much stigma, yet it's a big deal, like, Mm -hmm. for companies to enrol their HR managers into mental health first aider courses and stuff like that. And actually, it then puts the spotlight on you. And so if you're going through a mental health challenge, if someone's like, it's okay, I can help you, I'm a mental health first aider. It's like, okay, give me a minute, I still need a minute. Like, I'm not ready, I don't trust you because that's something that, that's a massive right thing. in work yeah. the trust it's all well and good you train up your employees to handle somebody um with a mental health challenge but you're not necessarily the person they're going to trust and it's like counseling is based on report coaching mm-hmm. is based on report Count- we'll talk about counseling more so because i 
find that if you're really, really struggling, that's that's the route you need to be going through. But with counselling, it's about rapport. It's about trusting your therapist. And the success of your progress is only going to be based on the trust you have within that relationship okay. with your therapist. Yeah. So if you can't trust your HR manager or office manager or wellbeing champion, whoever's been appointed in your company to help with somebody who's got mental health stuff going on, it's not going to work. And you're not going to want to go to them. Yeah. <laughs> it's as simple as that, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I feel like those kind of pieces are missing. There's this, you know, people are getting informed, and there's, like, when you go to Mind Charity's website, there's so much there, and Heads Together Charity as well. Yes. There's so much information there, which is great. But in the same way that me as a coach can't say that I'm a, a counsellor, it's the same really for employers to also take on this role of being a mental health champion like that you know there are plenty of counselors who don't mind getting extra work that's also consistent you know employ them to come in to talk to your staff you're going to get more out of it if you literally have a counselor come in spend the day once or twice a month to talk to your staff that's what's actually going to help you yeah more so than I'm sorry, than putting in a random yoga class or, you know, a bowl of fruit and, you know, (laughs) having a meditation pod. I mean, they all work if you're already there. But if you're suffering with your mental health, none of that's going to help you. And that's that's where I guess my concern comes from, right? Yeah, because I remember I had an amazing corporate company and you could take a mental health day and you could flexi work. And that that was amazing. Mm. They help you. But I was in, in a very good place and found comfort in a colleague who's a really good friend of mine now. And she was amazing. But I couldn't go to my manager or anyone up higher because they didn't understand. So if I couldn't do my work mm. or I really just was... Because when I'm in a bad place, I either really badly procrastinate, I don't want to do anything, I just avoid everything mm. and everyone... So I just put off work. So then I'd get into trouble with that. It's like, yeah. why aren't you doing your work? Or, like, why have you taken some time out? Or, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> why haven't you replied to my email? And it's like, whoa, that's, it's chaotic. Yeah. It, it's making things worse. So if you're accusing me whilst I'm not in a good place, I'm not going to want to go to you for advice. Yeah. And, like you say, if there is somebody who's mental health supporter at work if you don't trust them if you necessarily have had a bad relationship with them in the past or not Mm -hmm. a good rapport with them or they said a comment about your dress one day at work you're just not going to want to go to them for that advice and support and if I had that at work at the time I it probably wouldn't have helped because I needed some serious help Mm. so I think I think there's our how and it's to find someone because we've all got someone at least that we can trust and if we can't trust somebody then there are plenty of resources out there for you to get that support and Samaritans would be my number one shout out for this kind of situation if you really don't have somebody in your life that you can talk to call Samaritans because they are there to talk to you it's okay as an easy resource you know compared to signing up to counseling if you can't afford it etc etc but if you can afford it there are plenty of counsellors available to you yeah, that yeah. you can sign up with. So and the don't... NHS as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. The NHS too. So you've got to, you've got to find somebody that you can trust. Yeah. Okay. Because that is, I think, for both of us in our own experiences, that's what we needed. Dwayne, my husband, was the person that I trusted. Yeah. And he, I mean, he came in when I was ready to go sort of thing and was that he just grabbed me by the shoulders and was like this is not happening yeah, what are you doing yeah and it was that sort of that actually shocked me into the present moment and I was yeah. like oh, I don't want this I do not want this and even for yourself like with daddy <laughs> <laughs> shout out, shout out to daddy. um even with daddy like 
he being the person that you trust, you know, yeah. with all your friends and everybody around you and all the people, he was your person. Yeah. Micah says this a lot. He, they're my person. But he was your person. Like, find your person. They are there. Yeah. And if you don't have a person, the Samaritans are your person. Yeah. And go and get that help and support you need because it is there. It does exist and you will come out. All, I guess, what we're saying is just... I don't want to sound again a bit like airy fairy, but trust in the process. The process works. Yeah, you know? it definitely does. And it's a long process. Yeah. It takes time. Like, you know, I've had many setbacks mm. and, you know, first happened in 2014. We're in 2020 and yeah. I still have issues. Yeah. But it's knowing that when you do, you have someone to go to or you have the resources, like a toolkit, I suppose. Yeah, exactly that. To kind of guide you and say oh okay but if you've if you've crawled back once you can crawl back a hundred times as long as you have the tools mm. the support and we, i know we've said it many times but it is the support network uh, it, people need to support people yeah. and you know it is about who you trust but even if it's someone that you connect with on instagram and absolutely you really like them and you know you're having a message and you see something and they look sad just, yeah because it doesn't okay? have to be yeah. it doesn't have to be your current network of people because i think that's also the default that we go into that we go to our current friends and family and sometimes they're not the right people but that's okay your people do exist people that you can connect with do exist and like you say using social media in that vein i'm pro it yeah because that safety of talking to essentially a stranger does make you feel more comfortable somebody who can be empathetic and, and you know understand or supportive in the way that you need it to be mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant resource as well and I saw something recently I think I remember telling you the other day and it was um just a post and it said mind buddy mm. and this lady had posted and said you know I just wanted to shout out that I've actually been struggling and I have struggled quite a long time mm. uh with depression and it might just be that you need someone to talk to. So I'm putting this post out here to say, why not connect? Mm. Message me if you want somebody to talk to and maybe I can connect you with somebody yeah. that can just listen to you. Because yeah. sometimes it is just about being listened to and just someone saying... Do you know that's, that's the key, okay. actually, what you say there about being listened to? Because what I struggled with, and I think you're probably the same because we're quite similar, but I struggled with people listening there was always that like Dwayne did it a lot he was trying to fix me constantly and I was like I'm not ready to be fixed yeah. I, I I know I want to be fixed but I'm not ready to be fixed so right now I just need you to listen to the crap that I'm spewing out yeah. I just need it out you know 100% and, and my mum also is amazing just as amazing as my dad but she struggled quite a lot mm. seeing me you know yes. lack confidence Mine as well. and she's like mm oh, it's my baby, I, I don't want to see you sad, what yeah. can I do, I need to help you, let me help you, like, you know, she always helps me, yeah. she's always been there, yeah. at every, every step of the way, um, but, you know, she couldn't help me, because I wasn't, like you say, I wasn't ready to be helped, I might have been guided, but yeah. I wasn't ready. You weren't ready for that nurturing. You you yeah. wanted that sort of that. that now you love that. I yeah, know you love oh, I love that. it. <laughs> Get my <laughs> tea in. Exactly. <laughs> you're right there. But when you're in that sort of really really dark place, it's a different kind of support you 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 need at that moment, right? It's and completely it's different. Completely different. It's difficult to describe, but I hope that we've sort of articulated it enough <laughs> that you can understand it. And it's. Yeah, like I say, it's tricky. Yeah. It's finding that balance mm. of helping yourself and taking that advice and support yeah. from other people. And bear with us on this because we're not talking about people who've had devastating childhood trauma where it is a lot harder. Believe us, we we know we know that that's not the the sort of place that we're we're talking about. So someone who would be susceptible to crisis, for instance, yeah. their challenges are going to be a lot more serious than ours were. Ours yeah. were challenging, but they were more adult experience traumas rather than things like sexual abuse as a child and stuff. Those sort of traumas are going to be a lot more difficult to come through and 100%. to make the choice because you're sort of born or you're you've grown up knowing a particular version of life and yeah. it's going to be harder with you guys but you the support is still there again yeah. you know you've got to kiss a few frogs when it comes to therapy it's you, you know you've yeah. got to shop around you've got to experience the counselors and 
find that one that is your person mm. as well and you are going to be able to get the help you need and we're not saying don't take the medication the medication has its place and certainly take it if it's relevant to you but just be a bit more mindful be a bit more informed about taking medication you know before you take that choice because coming off it they don't often talk about that but that is the toughest part of going through depression is coming off the medication and relying on yourself and if you're in a sedated state of mind which yeah. is what the medication does you're never really in reality because you never really know what is... Yeah, you don't know what is real, what's not. Yeah. You're in a completely different place. Yeah. I mean, I I didn't... I had never taken medication. Um, and we've kind of spoken about mm. our views on uh, medication, and I agree with you. I, I do think there's a place, a, a time and a place for it. It does get handed out too quickly. Yeah. And it, I just feel if there's some p- part of you that can just say, hang on a second, I can do this on my own... Mm. And find that help from somebody else or something else that's not a tablet. I th- I think it's worth just considering it. Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, those are our opinions <laughs> on that. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little caveat on that. Those are Pooja and India's opinions on depression and mental health awareness and how you can find the help you need to get through accepting it's a journey I think definitely to round it up accepting it's a journey is probably a really big step choosing to make the change and finding people that you can trust really really trust they're the ones who can really help you Mm -hmm. and there is there is so much resource out there to educate yourself up on everything we've talked about today everything from medication through to counsellors through to the journey itself and you know the different stages of depression etc so have a good read and get yourself really informed so you can make those conscious choices it doesn't matter which choice you make if medication is your route fine but just make that choice consciously because then you're protecting yourself in the process as well and know why you're doing it yeah exactly definitely so to end the show my lovely (laughs) can you share with the listeners your top three Ooh. self-care tips like what is keeping you in this great place right now in your mind what so do you do doing things for myself what does that mean so that is if i don't so it's quite a, a tricky one but if you don't want to it's saying no i think sometimes I'm, saying I'm, no. I'm i'm hard like i'm hard on myself mm-hmm. because I want to say yes to everything and i want to be but we learned that on the retreat you can't say yes to everything and I want to please everybody. You really can't please everybody. And it's that realisation that you can't do that. So say say no and do things for yourself Mm -hmm. that makes you feel better. So if that is not going to dinner one night because you're really tired or you just need some you time, that's okay. Yeah. Um, Also, like, do the things that you love. Mm. Keep doing those. Um, Whether that's, like, running or swimming mm. or whatever it might be crafts or art I don't know but keeping that like my friend the other day said that she's doing improvisation lessons yeah, like fine. totally random <laughs> but they make her really happy she also struggles yeah. so for her she's found something on a Saturday that makes her happy yeah. and she's made loads of friends from it so it has you know a cycle um what's my third one it's a tricky one keep positive try to keep positive what does that mean so there's always going to be struggles and setbacks and things that are going to affect you and hurt you and make you upset Mm -hmm. but it's knowing that there's always a way out of that and there's always like a a positive surrounding if if something bad happens Mm -hmm. there's a positive reason that that might have happened Mm -hmm. it's not always to look negatively at Mm -hmm. it and kind of holding on to that um like light I suppose yeah 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 thank <laughs> you and you may plug yeah go you my plug it, yeah so um follow me at India J Creations on Instagram <laughs> and that's also my store name on Etsy and Facebook <laughs> she makes these I don't know what they're called what they're called macrame plant hangers and macrame bunting oh I've got fairy doors 
little girls fairy doors i suppose little boys do there's some in sort of magical christmasy i'm not gonna lie i don't normally i don't actually get it (laughs) (laughs) some of this like she's done these beautiful little fairies i saw and i was like where would you put that but the stuff that she makes oh my god it's so beautiful (laughs) it's so stunning and like honestly so creative like I'm, i'm i'm a creative person too but the way india creates these things i just like mind blown when i see them so definitely check her out india jade creations and do you know what if you've enjoyed the podcast if you enjoyed listening to india's story hit her up on social media as well because india's a very open person and she is more than happy to be that stranger that supports you as well so i'm not an expert and you know i'm definitely not an expert i'm not perfect and i but i i can try and relate and you know that's I'm here for. Yeah, so if you want to chat, you know, I mean, obviously you can hit us both up, but... I love to chat. (laughs) Yeah, we both love to chat. Yeah, Yeah. we definitely do. (laughs) Yeah, just give us a a stalk on social. Yeah. All good. 100%. We hope that's been a good show for you. Thank you so much, babe, for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. I think we've literally gone like two hours, but... (laughs) (laughs) It's a record, so... (laughs) Lots of editing, but... Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. I'm so proud of the journey that you've been on and everything you've done. I literally wouldn't be in the place that I am without having have gone on that retreat and having have met you so thank you oh god <laughs> yeah no she's gonna make me cry don't i'm gonna cry <laughs> it's emotional <laughs> stop it stop it and and final big shout out to daddy yes my dad for putting me and india together because i think that actually personally i think india's going to be in my life for a very long time yeah i hope so, so yeah <laughs> thank you both thank you thank you for listening to the self-care 101 podcast If you enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you would subscribe and review so that other people like you can find the show. For more tips and tricks, you can follow me on the socials at Frankly Coaching or visit my website to find out more about my coaching programs and how to work with me at franklycoaching.com.